I would like to see him found and confronted. I think he should know the deep and lasting damage that he did to me. I need to know if his life has been affected or if he's sorry for what he did. I need to believe that there is some form of justice operating in this world. He was such a nice boy. She shouldn't have invited the guy in in the first place. We didn't know whether to blame Laura. That's not just the, the ugly, funny-looking person that's going to rape. Her face. I just saw her broken. I think that women raped are treated worst by the people that they love. It was the eve of Christmas Eve, and it was late, and I opened the door to let the dog out, and just at that moment, uh, someone must have been passing by, I didn't actually see them pass, but suddenly from behind the bushes, I heard a voice saying, hello. I wasn't quite sure whether this was someone that I should know, so I walked out to the gate to talk to him. He wasn't much older than my neighbor's son, and I saw him just as a, uh, an older child. I asked him what, which school he went to, and he said he went to the school where I had been. And he said, oh, can I use your toilet? So uh, I said, yes, yes, okay, of course you could use the toilet. So um, he came in. We chatted for a while and everything was very pleasant and then all of a sudden he jumped up and put his arms around me. Now um, I immediately flung myself free and said no, you mustn't do that. He hit me across, the, uh, uh, across my face and sent me spinning. It was such, uh, it was such a surprise. Uh, up to that point I really didn't have any fear that this was a sexual, a, um, a sexual or a rape or anything. I was simply dealing with a little bit of a naughty child. He dropped his pants and uh, he um, thrust his penis in my mouth. I was not compliant. I was not giving in in any way. I was fighting. This child had, had turned into a monster in front of my eyes and this monster was attacking me and now I was fighting for dear life. So he must have kicked me so viciously and then he left and I think that he left me for dead and he probably hoped I was. <laughs> In the middle of the night, I got woken up with the doorbell ringing and went to the door and Laura was standing on my stoop with absolutely nothing on and her face covered with blood. Cecily took me to the hospital and there I saw myself in the mirror and I turned around to see who was standing behind me because that reflection that I saw couldn't possibly be me. I didn't go into the house. I was actually, I didn't want to go near the house. It was, it was like the scene of, a, of the most unspeakable horror. They had to drill holes into my head here and here, and they put an enormous um, iron cage in front of me here. I wanted to scream. 
what have you done to my face? What has happened? I expected them to, to put it back in the most defiant voices. They told me, oh, but your jaw was so shattered, we couldn't possibly have put it back. And what the heck did you expect? Her face was like a parody of what it had been. And I'm, 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 I'm talking about the face because that's the physical outside. If the face was like that, what happened to her soul? Oh. For a long, long time, I have simply avoided looking at my face in the mirror. I look at the particular part that I'm dealing with. I never look at the big picture. I avoid it to such an extent that I'm not even sure now what I look like anymore. I never thought I was beautiful, but I was happy with the face I had. I worked hard to keep myself young and attractive, even through the dark years of my volatile marriage to Peter, a promising young filmmaker who became an alcoholic. And with hindsight, I should have left him by the side of the road many years ago. I'd had a musical upbringing and a brief and successful career on the stage, but that ended with children and the need to be a breadwinner. I hadn't wanted children, but a statement like that in the 1950s brought only condemnation. Still, I had two children, Michael, boisterous and headstrong, and Kathy, who was painfully shy as a child. And I made the decision to devote myself entirely to the task of being as good a mother as I possibly could be. I remember just how we'd come home from school and Laura would be in the lounge with him. Remember, she loved her records, hey? She'd have her records playing and she'd be dancing. Uh, dancing in the light. Yeah, when we'd arrive home, she'd say, come on, girls, drop the bags, let's dance. And she'd, we'd have some lunch and she'd play piano tunes for us. My children are very different. And I was surprised that it was Kathy who followed in her father's footsteps and became a filmmaker. She moved to Australia and Michael stayed, married, and took up motor car racing. I finally divorced Peter and lived alone in Hope Road. Some people may have regarded me as a bit of an eccentric, but I had some good friends. Now, I felt sorry for her because I always thought she was kind of lonely, but I don't think she was. I think she was just that kind of person that could be on her own. She um, had very strong opinions. I didn't always agree with her. We used to have lots of arguments. She was intense. She was, I think she was talented. I was very fond of her. She used to she used to get on my nerves often, but um, I loved her. I'd been living in Australia for 15 years, and my filmmaking career was just beginning when Cecily phoned me. It was Christmas Eve, and she said, something terrible's happened. Your mother's in hospital. I completely underestimated the extent of the trauma and it took me a couple of months to put my life on hold and my stuff in storage and get over to Johannesburg, not knowing how long I'd be there. My mother was out of the hospital and the iron cage had been removed and she was putting on a brave face. Not long after my arrival, she let me film her doing a tour of the house. We were sizing each other up, not knowing how to deal with the situation. She wanted to appear as if she was coping, but the camera became a grim voyeur. My brother Michael and I had never been very close, and as adults we'd always lived on different continents. Even then he was suspicious of my motives for filming, but he covered it with his own brand of humour, like his impersonation of the South African police. SAP? Yeah. Hey, has you got a licence for that camera? Eh? Are you got a licence to drive that thing? No, but you see this now. Eh? You see this? They come here from overseas. 
and they want to sort of make, make movies of everything. They don't know what's going on here. Huh? They think he's always pushing the blacks, eh? <laughs> For me, Johannesburg during those last years of apartheid was not a laughing matter. The fear I felt in Hope Road was intense and very real. The neighbours told me that two women alone in a house without security fences was asking for trouble, and Laura was afraid her attacker might return. So I hired an armed guard to watch the house day and night. But he couldn't protect Laura from the real tormentors in her midst. In Laura's case, um, a certain amount of it was brought upon by herself. The fact that to invite a person into your house after midnight to come in and have a cup of tea or something like that in the current situation is not done. We didn't know whether to blame Laura for being out at night and for inviting somebody into her house. One didn't know who to blame or how it had happened. Yes, I did hear that she asked for it. I did. I just saw her broken, like a human being was taken and spirit crushed her. It was too terrible. Not long after I arrived, my mother fell to pieces. I just wanted to die. Life had ceased to be of, uh, of any value whatsoever and I just wanted to die. And so I was totally uncooperative in any kind of healing process. I'd say she was shattered absolutely shattered because it was her face, which is a person's self, as it were, the self they present to the world. And as I said, very depressed, suicidal. If you go into the garden and you pick a beautiful rose and you put it into a vase, you might say, is that rose dead or alive? It looks alive, but in actual fact, it's been cut off from its source. So it's alive, but it's dead in a way. And often after these traumatic things, or even a terrible illness, the person gets it into their mind that they're, they're alive, but they're not alive. They've been killed in a way. It's that kind of, as I say, death imprint. And I think suicide goes a lot with that. I went to the hospital to see her. That was the first time. She was beaten, knocked about. The police delegated this whole thing to a retired female police officer. But she had the uh, foresight to go to the school and to ask them for the school magazine. And she came back with this magazine and I looked through it. There was a photograph of the rugby team. And when I saw it, I picked him out immediately. And I saw, that's him. It was the emotion of, I found him. I went to see the investigating officer who was handling the case, Jan van der Mescht. He told me that the suspect was overseas, that the boy's father had threatened to sue him for false accusation, and it was his word against my mother's. He gave me photocopies of some documents from the file and advised me to drop the case. My main concern was keeping Laura alive and getting her to Australia, so I took his advice. I had no idea how important the issue of getting justice was to become, and I was to bitterly regret that decision. It took seven months and several face operations and suicide threats before I was able to convince Laura to come with me to Australia. I packed her belongings and sold the house, and she said goodbye to the world she had come to completely distrust. Can you get me out of that? My neighbours put on a wonderful farewell party for me, and I played the gracious guest. But despite it all, I felt angry and betrayed. It seemed as if the entire world was saying to me, you brought this on yourself. I just wanted to withdraw and have nothing to do with any of them. In Australia, I lived in a small flat in Sydney for several months, but I didn't cope well with my new circumstances 
When my depression deepened, I stopped playing the piano and my creative spring dried up. I put on weight so that no man would ever look at me in that way again. I was having memory lapses and trouble with even simple words and phrases. And I really believed that my face was so disfigured that I looked like a monster. Laura went into psychiatric care for three years and then moved into a small housing commission flat and became a virtual hermit. They called it post-traumatic stress, but for Laura, life was meaningless and she wanted nothing to do with the outside world. And time did not heal. Seeing my mother shut herself away for all those years, I felt as if I'd lost her and nothing I could do would bring her back. Finally, in desperation, I proposed going back to Johannesburg to try and get the case reopened. Laura was dubious at first, but she agreed. It was becoming clear that without some form of justice, she would never get over it. I hadn't been back since I'd taken Laura away after the attack and I wasn't looking forward to it. My attitude coloured everything. All I could see was a city living behind razor wire and locked doors. To me, it was a city of fear. Even my mother's house in Hope Road had become just a brick wall. My first stop was to see Cecily, Laura's former neighbour and close friend. Is it the society, is it the, does it reflect the values of, of the guardians of our society that, that they didn't find the, the child? Um, I actually, I don't know. Was it a whitey thing? Was it a, a policeman protecting a white child that could have been his son? Laura showed me a picture from the Highlands Boys High School magazine that the police that somebody had given her and she they, she was asked to identify and she identified what looked like one young man and of course it's somebody that I happen to know he was at school with my children see that the same age as my children but it, apparently it turned out not to be him when I showed Cecily the photo and pointed to the boy she actually said to my face that I must be mistaken because he looked such a nice boy, and she knew him. People don't realise how devastating it is to be disbelieved when you are so adamant as I was about my attacker. Police station, Superintendent John Miles was now in charge, and he and his assistant had been searching their archives for Laura's file for three days. The news was not good. Now, I've got five. It must be destroyed. This is the last hope? Yeah, these two were the last. Uh, the file was, according to the investigator, mm -hmm. submitted to the public prosecutor, declined to prosecute. And, um, but uh, it's we, been destroyed. We've got to make assumptions, you know, when we say what happened to the file, you know. So we, we can't give you a direct answer to say. It seemed very strange that the files before and after Laura's were there, but her case file, or docket as they called it, was missing. The previous investigating officer, Jan van der Mescht, had since retired from the police force, but John Miles rang him while I was in his office. I wasn't allowed to film the conversation, but Miles later repeated the information to me over the phone. I spoke to him while you were here. Uh, he does uh, remember interviewing an accused and taking the case to the public prosecutor for the decision. That's right. Yeah. So. This is, he called him a hard heart, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, a difficult, difficult suspect. Yeah, well, difficult, yeah. That can mean anything. It can mean evasive, but difficult, uh, not truthful. But the suspect had admitted being in my mother's house, didn't he? He remembered yeah. that, that he was feeding yeah. dogs. Or well, he mentioned that he was walking past and he was inv invited in and things like that. That he recalled immediately. I spoke to him, yeah. 
So yes, yes, that's. So. And uh, he, I mean, he, he he wouldn't have that unless the com the accused had acknowledged that. If you see what. Yeah. yeah. This information from Fundamesht was a great breakthrough, and I asked John Miles to set up a meeting for us. But when Fundamesht heard that I was back in town and making a film about the case, things changed. He didn't turn up for our arranged meeting, and he evaded me for five days. Finally, Fundamesht told me by phone that he was going on an extended hunting trip and didn't know when he'd be back. My time in Johannesburg was running out, and it was clear that I was not going to be able to meet him. I wanted to scream with frustration. It was at this point that I realised that without his cooperation and the original case docket, getting justice was going to be very difficult. And then, just days before I was due to leave Johannesburg, I met Charlene Smith. She is a high-profile journalist who was raped in 1999 and made her story front page news. Her message for Laura was to be a turning point for me. If you want the person to get caught, and if you want the person to go to jail, you have to prepare yourself for an unbelievably traumatic fight. You have to fight and fight and fight. You get frustrated about the fact that you're fighting with everyone. You have to fight with the police, you have to fight with the prosecutors, you have to fight with the medical officers, you have to fight with every single person. And in the end, for me, this was the worst thing that happened to me. And if I wanted justice, I had to fight. If I wanted him to stop doing it to another woman, I had to fight. But it's a difficult process. It's a difficult process and you often want to give up because it's very traumatic. Kathy came back feeling like she'd achieved very little. But the very fact that someone was prepared to believe me and to listen for the first time got me going again. I made a tentative step and I've joined the University of the Third Age and there we have a, a group that is studying philosophy and then there's a discussion group and both of them I find very stimulating. Programs called Seasons for Growth and the name is relevant. I'm learning slowly, I'm trying to, to get on with people. You made any friends? Yes, I've made. I've made some very good, some, I think I've made a few friends. There was a slow awakening there that perhaps somebody else could be interested in my dark secret, my nightmare that I've been trying to sweep under the carpet and uh, I've, been, I've spent a whole, I've spent years and years and years trying to, to forget it and to to uh, put it aside, and now here's an opportunity where perhaps uh, you can you can draw some good out of it. These are the African ways of honor to you. Encouraged by Laura's tentative steps, and with Charlene Smith's words about the need to fight for justice still echoing in my head, I went back. The country had changed so much since I grew up here, and on this second trip, I was feeling more optimistic. I made the decision to try and find something positive from what had happened to Laura, and to look at the country through new eyes. Even though the world around him had changed so dramatically, my brother Michael hadn't. I've always been 
the Engelsman, the, the alien, the person that, who are you? You don't fit in with us. I didn't fit in with them, I don't fit in with this crowd. It means nothing to me. It, the, 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 the new flag just looks like Winnie Mandela's underpants or something like that. I've got no idea how to relate to it or anything like that. This is a pump action shotgun. Carries 12 in rounds the... up in this tube here. I have two daughters and the, the subject of rape is obviously one of those things that is on your mind the whole time. The guard here is me. I put up a very, very big mean demeanor and I carry a big shotgun. You can put it against your shoulder like this and shoot like that. But that is if you really want to actually aim specifically. This is our family's defense mechanism against this because you're not going to get the police or any any fellow citizens or anyone else to, to watch out for you. I'm ready for this. Ready for action. Michael had never told his daughters about what really happened to Laura. They always assumed their grandmother had deserted them for the good life in Australia. Down and then ready to shoot. Michael's warnings made me realise that I was unprepared for the potential dangers of this city and I should take some precautions. So I hired a personal bodyguard and driver. I'm going to drive you, I'm going to look after you. Yeah. So whatever the show you have to be. I know sometimes when you go to like Soweto, Alexander, so you need something to be protected. So normally I, I've got my firearm with me. Okay. Moshe Dan became my constant companion and friend and took me to places I would never have otherwise visited. He also suggested novel ways of dealing with stress. How do I cook this? No, don't cook it. Don't cook it. You don't cook it? What do you Just do? grate it. Ne? Grate it? You and wash then your body. You wash your body with yes, it? Yes, yeah. And vomit with it. I vomit? Yes. Okay. Probably need some of that. Mm. Okay. Um, that's going to be an interesting experience. Mm. Under the new South African government, a unit had been established in Johannesburg to deal specifically with sexual assault and child rape cases. The head of the unit was Superintendent Andre Neertling, and he had some good news for me. We are the investigative authority. We are not the prosecuting authority. But what we can do from our side is to reopen the case and look at those questions that you had, because if a case was withdrawn, it can be reopened at any time and, and uh, revisit all the evidence and things like that presented to the prosecutor mm -hmm. and see how far we get with regards to that to, to, to also provide you people with some kind of closure, I suppose. <laughs> Andre assigned the case to Captain Arnold Buenstra and gave me permission to follow the investigation and to film it. Police work in Johannesburg is dangerous and hundreds of police officers are killed each year in the line of duty. Arnold and his buddy Ferdy always worked together and their main focus was the investigation of serial rapists and child rape. That looks like a good healthy breakfast there. Yeah, yeah that's great. That's why I'm so healthy. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of stress, especially long hours. Um, Public cases you work on sometimes catches up on you. I'm involved in more funny stuff, so see the worst. Never see any good. So there's a bit of stress. How do you deal with that? I see a psychologist. <laughs> you have to. I found Arnold and Ferdy's world very stressful. It reminded me too much of the bad old days of the apartheid era, even though they were now looking for rapists, not political activists. But they wanted me to see the battleground they worked in. Most people in South Africa are black and just a small percentage are white, around about 10% of us are white, and the rape graphs follow that almost completely. So most women getting raped are black women getting raped by black men. However, you get white men who rape and you get white women who are raped. It's 
it, it isn't a racial issue at all. It's a, a societal issue of disrespect toward women and children. Arnold arranged for me to meet with the elderly volunteer police reservist, Myra Carroll, who'd worked on Laura's case back in 1989. She'd done most of the legwork, including getting the photo from the school. She didn't remember many details of the case, and she was hesitant about which boy my mother had identified from the photo. Could it be this one? Yes, exactly. Honestly? Yes. I don't that's I don't it. remember that it does. So why is it that you pointed? You think you pointed to that one? I don't know. Mm. She remembered immediately. Know. As soon as she you showed her, she said, "That's him." I don't know. That's why I, I was so hesitant, because really I don't remember. But isn't that strange that I should have done that? Everything was put in the docket and handed over. Definitely, that's how I always do. So I don't keep anything. Would they have asked you to interview the suspect? No. We're going to see the previous investigating officer, uh, Jan van der West. He's on pension now. And see what information he can give us about the whole case. Finally, I was going to meet with Jan van der Mest. I wanted to find out why he'd evaded me on my previous visit and whether he would tell Arnold what he had told the police superintendent, John Miles, a year ago while I was in his office, that he had interviewed a suspect who admitted being in my mother's house, but denied the assault. Van der Mesh agreed that I could attend the meeting and film it, so long as it was just the camera resting on my knee. But I never said I interviewed a guy in this case, never. From the beginning, I denied any knowledge of somebody been arrested or interviewed in this matter. You know, I was in his office when you spoke to John Miles. Mm -hmm. I was there and I heard you say this. Saying what? Saying this thing that you'd spoken to the suspect. Hell, I never said that. But never I was in, in my life. Office there. No, of course I'm not. not do you understand that. Afrikaans? Yeah, I do. Why should I lie to you? For what reason? I don't know. I can't understand it. I just want to get the name of the guy that you spoke to. I Why? never interviewed anybody in this case, ma'am. This I can guarantee you. And I never said this to John Marks. You said to me, when I came to see you in 1989, you said to me that the parents had threatened you. They threatened you with false accusation. If you continued with this investigation, you'd spoken to the parents and that's what they said. And when I said at the time, how can you conduct an investigation? You just say, well, that's how it is. It's possible, I can't remember. So you could have spoken to the parents? Oh, it's possible. It's possible, I can't remember exactly. You can't remember where he lived or no, even one all. tiny nothing, bit of information? Nothing at all. I'm a total blank. So do you think he's telling the truth? I don't, I don't know what you think. My frustration at this point hit a high note, but I didn't get much support from Arnold. He wasn't interested in uncovering whether an ex-police officer was lying or not. He just wanted to track down some hard evidence. Captain Wertha speaking. I need to find out old fingerprints of 1988. Yeah, it's an old case of rape that was investigated. Arnold told me that the fingerprints may take some time to track down. And I also had to face the reality of his daily workload. He had over 80 cases that he was currently investigating, including many of child and baby rape. And understandably, these had to take precedence over my mother's case. We've got 1,800 cases that we investigate at the moment, which is all we cannot distinguish between our cases. Um, these are all, it's not property crime. These are all assault on people. So we have to give equally uh, uh, attention to all of them. But uh, I think by the end of November, we should be able to at least uh, give you a an, an, an good answer in terms of where we stand. Wherever I went, it was staring me in the face. The extent of rape in South Africa was horrific and the statistics were almost beyond belief. 
A woman is raped every 26 seconds. A South African woman, one in two South African women will be raped at least once in her lifetime. I deal with rape survivors who've been raped three times, which is really difficult. Um, 75% of rape is gang rape. You're more likely to be raped by anything from three to 30 perpetrators than by a single individual. A very, very high rate of incest. Um, we have a particular problem at the moment because our incidence of HIV is so high that there's a very high rate of virgin rape. There's a belief that if you rape a virgin, you can cleanse yourself of HIV. So we're seeing, uh, last year we saw a doubling of child rape. Charlene spends much of her time helping the survivors of sexual assault and their families. And it was at one of what she calls her survivor lunches that I met Glory and her twin daughters. The two-year-old twins had been raped and sodomised by a man she thought of as a trusted friend who persuaded her to allow him to pick the twins up from preschool every day. And he, he raped them repeatedly, maybe for three weeks. Every time, every day, where, how? You, you don't I, don't know. Know. I don't know. I wish I could know. No, you don't want to know. Did they tell you? Yeah, you they tell. Out? They even demonstrate even the noises he was making that time when he was raping them. You know, they talk, they say it like it is. <laughs> Nice to see you again. Good to see. Glory was not a woman to let life get the better of her. Before her daughters were born, their father had flown the coop, so she employed a full-time housekeeper and nanny to look after the twins, and she kept her job as a flight attendant with South African Airways. Glory had been to a court hearing the previous day in relation to the rape of her twin daughters and was furious at the outcome. The perpetrator, who lived four doors down the street from her, had been released on bail. I was so depressed, I couldn't even have dinner. I had this terrible headache, and I think maybe it must have been nerves or what, because I couldn't just believe that um, they are uh, reminding it to next year, February. It's four months, it's too much. And this guy's still walking around free. He was in a new suit, new shoes, new shirt, and he was so boastful and like, I don't know. He's still around, I saw him yesterday. This is dangerous, you know, it's like a virus, it's like something, we should stop this now. The delays and problems with the police and justice system that Glory and I were experiencing were extremely common. But instead of just grumbling, Glory and her family took action. She poured all her rage into a petition to President Mbeki in the hope of drawing attention to our frustrations. You know, we've got to put our, our feet down that they should do it. Send people out there uh, to go and educate those people in all the languages all the 11 official languages. My letters back to Laura about my progress were starting to have an effect, and she was beginning to see the bigger picture. If we are going to have a safer world for women, the first thing that we've got to do is the painful process of exposure, which is what I'm doing now. And that if, uh, if women go on trying to, to hush it up and ignore it and pretend it doesn't happen, uh, they are never going to address any kind of, uh, of steps to stop it. And then it will just carry on. Glory took me to the court hearing of a young eight-year-old girl who had been brutally raped and mutilated. The local community was staging a protest outside the court to highlight their frustrations with the justice system and to vocalise their rage. This is taking its toll on the poor family. Now is the time to take your account. 
and shoot the enemy. If we find a perpetrator, somebody who's raping our children, we are not going to bring him here because we are wasting our time. We are going to kill him there and then. It will be tit for tat, butter for fat. We are tired. I sugar. The perpetrator usually buys uh, the investigating officer or whoever that handles the dockets. That's what has been said, that they pay them the money and then all of a sudden the docket gets lost. And they know that once the docket is lost, everything, the, how are they going to proceed now? The ultimate end is that that man will walk out free because there's no evidence. The evidence that was there is no more. I went to ask Andre if he had any clues as to why all the information relating to Laura's case seemed to be missing. You know, things disappear, but not everything. Um, you know, yes, dockets do disappear, especially if they're that old. And, and there's, in the meantime, there's a lot of things to do to improve, uh, to improve our archive systems and that. But, um, yeah, it happened from time to time. But uh, not really that everything disappears. And we are looking into that at the moment to, to, to find out where, where these things disappear to. The fingerprints in Laura's case still hadn't been traced and the investigation was bogging down. And I started hassling Arnold for results. Somebody somewhere is lying. Have you thought of going to speak to either Superintendent Miles, John Miles or... No, that doesn't help. It's hearsay evidence. I need evidence, physical evidence that I can use now to link the suspect to the crown. You know, yes, say from John to this one to that one, it's not going to help me. I'm just desperate. I know that you are, and I feel with you, and uh, I have sleepless nights about this. Do you? Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, you should think, what, where have we gone wrong? What have we missed? You know, there's something missing here. There's a piece of the puzzle that's not there, uh, and we can't seem to find it. My frustrations with the slow pace and the obstacles in the police investigation were really getting me down, and I was desperate for signs of hope. The police told me about a playwright, Bongani Linda, working in Soweto, whose community theatre work on this issue was being performed in schools and prisons around the country to mainly male audiences. The theatre has played a very important role in popular education right from the days of apartheid protest theater, which was used as a tool to conscientize as well as as a tool to inform international audiences of what was happening in the country. You see, it's easy. Power, that's all it takes, it's a chapel. <laughs> If you ever dare go to the police, this house will be a foundation. And you'll be signing a tutorial. You hear what? No more? a very, very beautiful girlfriend who was gang raped and then she could not take it any longer, she committed suicide. I got very angry. I, I confronted one of the rapists. In that anger, I killed him. I was arrested, stayed for about 24 months on trial. But thanks God I was acquitted because charges were dropped against me. And then after that, you know, like I got very worried that what kind of a society is this? Because in fact, it just did not end then. Rape became a popular crime in our townships. And, you know, till today, it's still like that. It's sky high. It's crime number one. We've got this anger. And the anger that we have is taken to the wrong people. It's taken to our sisters. And you know, for me, this makes me very angry because, I mean, I've experienced it. I, I used to love that woman. She was part of me. We shed the same breath. Today, she's no more. 
Because some, I'm sorry to, to say this, but fucking bastards, barbarians, I prefer not to talk about it really because it breaks my heart every time. But rape is a men's problem more than anything. It's a men's problem and I'm worried because it's still fashionable. I call upon the men who are here as well as the boys, young men, let us make this our struggle. The safety of our mothers, the safety of our sisters, the safety of our aunts, their welfare, their dignity is our business. When a child is abused, I know it touches a, 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 a very tender part of us. Arnold still couldn't find the fingerprints and Laura's case had stalled. He was also preoccupied with the 1,800 other sexual assault cases his unit was investigating. And I realised that if I wanted things to move faster, I would have to take action myself. I found a private investigator who agreed to help me for a fee. OK, Thank I'll you. assist you in this regard as well. Thank you. Okay. And you guys have got access to hidden cameras? Yeah, I do have. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And a recorder for that matter. So we'll be able to, to record, record the audio and the video itself. Mm. OK. The private investigation company were very quick to deliver results. I gave them the name of the boy my mother had identified, which appeared on the school photograph. Within days, they were able to tell me where the suspect lived, that he owned two firearms, he was married and had recently had a baby son, and he owned a business with his brother. It didn't take long to find his workplace. So I found it, yeah. But then I didn't know what to do next. The thought of going in was too overwhelming and I felt completely out of my depth. Moshadan reminded me of the two guns the suspect owned and warned me to be careful. So I did a stakeout. It seemed to me now that my best option was to bite the bullet and confront the man my mother had identified with a hidden camera and find out what he had to say but I needed to be sure that what I was proposing was both legal and ethical. It's a strategic choice in many ways rather than a legal choice. I mean, I think legally you have the right to do it. Um, strategically, one would have to weigh up what would be the impact of you doing it. Um, a, on the alleged rapist himself and whether you would silence him or open up the floodgates of his confession. I mean, we have no way of, of, of telling that. Um, and be on, on the police. I mean, would it annoy the police? Um, does that matter? The lawyer also told me that if I wanted to use the video of the confrontation as possible evidence, I should not reveal my intentions to the police. The thought of going out and facing the man who had caused all this trauma terrified me, and I kept hoping there would be some other way. Glory suggested we go to the ANC Women's League, a powerful women's lobby group. She believed that if we could speak to Nelson Mandela, we may be able to get some action for her twins and for my mother. She, she would like to, to have an audience le leadership here, Women's League. Like you are going to, call, on her behalf, going to confront the perpetrator. I think it's going, she's going to get a relief from that. Yeah, she's, she, she'll be now able to, 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 to let go now. Because why is she still holding on is that this person was not brought to book. That's why she, she is still holding on to this pain. But once she knows that it's being taken care of now, she'll be able to let go now. 
and I wish you all the luck. I wish for her sake. They they scared, Kathy. They scared. They they feel safe when the butler doors are locked. The alarm, even the alarm, they always remind us to switch the alarm on. Watching the twins playing with locks and bolts was heartbreaking. The man who had abused them lived just down the road and Glory believed they were in real danger. I completely understood her outrage at the system that had allowed him out on bail and why so many people felt the need to voice their anger at the extent of sexual violence. Glory finally collected over 10,000 signatures for her petition and presented it to the President's office in Pretoria. But she wasn't stopping there. She asked me to help her write letters to the Justice Minister and the Minister for Safety and Security. The bail was granted despite the fact that I informed the court of the danger he poses to my twins and my nanny. I want the President to stop giving these people bail. Okay. To me, it's a major thing. That's a big thing. Arnold rang me to say that he was going out to interview the suspect within a couple of days. Fear and anxiety were holding me back from doing what I knew I had to do, confront the man my mother had identified. It was now or never. That morning I awoke with a sick feeling in my stomach, but I'd come this far and this time I had to see it through. I still didn't know if I'd be in any danger and there was that awful nagging doubt. What if it was the wrong guy? I could just wear it over my shoulder like that. Or you that. could put it right over your this head. This way I can um, get it off if I need to. Or... Oh, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah. If you needed to run, I suppose, yeah. Still... So if I'm talking to you, is that getting a good picture? Well, as you can see there on the, on, the, on the screen, you can see the picture there. That's me there. Yeah. And yeah, that's That's just how I angle this thing. Yeah. That's going to be the key. Uh, yeah, in any direction you want to, basically. Because once I start this, what I'm doing, I'm not going to be thinking about this because I'm going to be thinking about the person I'm talking to. So yeah, sure. ask you something. It's a personal matter. Yes, okay. Please. I just wanted to ask you if you've ever thought about that woman that you assaulted in Orange Grove in 1988. Assaulted? Yeah. Who are you talking about? The woman that you assaulted in Hope Road, Orange Grove in 1988. That was my mother. Sorry? Who's your mother? My, my mother lived in Hope Road, Orange Grove and this is, um, she's identified you from a school photograph. You went to Highlands North School. So if you don't mind me asking, assaulted? Yeah. In what way? Sexually assaulted. Oh, do me a favour. Definitely not. Look, I can definitely help you. The police are about to come and question you. What, do, what are you talking about? Well, there's right? a lot of evidence. Who's your mother? My mother was the woman that was in that house that you went into that night. I don't know, and I don't know your mother from a bar, so you have my word. In, in the wildest genius, your mother's making a mistake. And you you have need my, to tell her that. I swear to you on my son's And if you life, do tell her and that I'll and she her. believes you, then she will Ma'am, withdraw. I tell you, she can come and I swear to you on my mother's life, on my mother's life, my son's life, on everybody's life, my family's life. I don't know what she's talking about. I swear to you. Do you want and me? I'd like to phone my father and ask him, if you don't mind, to come with me. I swear to you, I don't know what she's talking about. Hold on, but listen to me. Dad, Dad, does not. No, my dad's getting upset because he knows. He knows that it's not me. Dad? Yeah, but... Dad, Dad? He has to verify no, no. that the, what no, no. he told the police. Hold on. They say that you told the police that I... Agree, sorry, that I agreed that I was in Hope Street. But that you didn't assault my mother. No. Okay, can you bring a police number? Yes. Okay, Dad, I'll phone you back just now, okay? I'll, okay, but listen to me. Don't start shouting and screaming. Please, Dad. Please, Dad, listen to me. Don't start screaming and shouting, please. 
please just speak to my father because my dad's really upset now also about this. There's no way Hello. on this planet. So did you just, speak to the police? In, my name's on. Kathy. Dad, just tell him please. Is Kathy upset? Hinkle. Kathy Hinkle. Man, 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 I've man. I've to me... help your son. Man, hold on. Because my mother really has fast, identified him. No, no. Do me a favour. This From is a wrong. From a photograph. No, this is wrong. No, this lady says that I raped her mother in 1988 in Cape in in uh, in, in Hope Street. Hold Sorry, on. I don't want to have Hold your father on. shouting da, at me like da, that. Da, Listen, da, if you da. will meet me down the street, we can discuss how. Da, his da, father's da, gone da, ballistic. I could da, well imagine it, because his father probably thought, my God, thank God, you know, I got away with it, and and he's been, and now to be suddenly confronted with this. He's I'm sure he would go ballistic. I can well imagine. If you make a mistake, I'm telling you that now. You have my word. Was I, if you don't mind me asking, what was I wearing? Supposedly wearing. I don't know what she's talking about. I swear to you. She knows what you're wearing. She says she was with you for a long time. She's making... No, 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 honey. She's making a mistake. Okay. 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 He yeah. says you shouldn't talk to me. Yeah. And I understand why, man, because... It, it, the thing is that one of these assaults really sticks, and that's why I thought, you know, if you could talk to my I'd mother... Like to, in fact, your mother's more than welcome to come out and she can face me face to face, and then yeah. tell me, because I promise you, you have my word. OK, I've got nothing to hide. I feel devastated because there doesn't seem to be any any resolution now. He He's, he's just got to a point of, of denying where are you going to go from there? He's just going to go on denying and denying. The confrontation left me shaken and confused. I realised how naive I'd been to hope that he would confess. And yet the way he reacted just didn't make any sense. He didn't ask even the most basic questions other than how did you find me and what was I wearing? And why did he immediately go and ring his father? I desperately needed to debrief and went back to the psychiatrist Laura had seen after the attack. I'd say that even getting to speak to his family, getting to speak to him, has done a lot to frighten him very badly. More than, maybe even more than coming in front of the police and everything. I think you've got a lot of justice by going there. A lot of justice done because you've terrified him. He's not going to be able to live with himself. He knows that somebody knows who he is. He knows that you know. He knows that this is going... You're going back to Australia and people know. He's not going to be able to... He's not going to be able to live with himself as easily as maybe he's lived with himself, which he probably hasn't managed easily. When I told Arnold what I'd done, he didn't object. And in fact, he took a copy of the video of the confrontation as part of his evidence. The suspect responded by hiring a lawyer and refused further contact with me. I had to accept that our legal case was weak. It was his word against Laura's. Arnold told me he'd been out to interview the suspect and he'd come up with an alibi. When I next saw Arnold, he'd been to Cape Town to check it out. The hotel that they claim to have stayed in has subsequently closed down. The one wing's been completely broken down and the other one is standing empty. So there was no verification of his alibi. It's his word and those of his witnesses so hard because my mother is so certain that it was this guy and I just have to keep believing that. I tried and I'm not giving up. It's bad to just give up. Somewhere along the line something should happen. Glory's letters and petition had hit the mark and she was getting attention from officials high up in the system. The South African government was acknowledging the extent of the crisis and making sexual assault a priority area. My letters are everywhere. <laughs> you know, 
Oh, I'm a government department. People keep on saying, but who is this Glory Lhodi? Some are on the corridors with the fires. They say, I should contact Glory Lhodi. I should go see this. It's amazing. I can see a light. There is a light there at the end of the tunnel. It's shining brightly. You know, um, they all involved, they all concerned. Uh, they telling me that over the telephone when they come here. I want to help women and children because I think there's a big gap there. People are there struggling and I realize that people, you know, get tired when they busy with their cases and something goes wrong. They just say, ah, I'm just going to leave it at that because, you know, it's so tiring. We both have experienced this thing. You know, you, you can't just go on without any light. So people uh, give up most of the time. So I want to encourage people not to give up. Christmas was fast approaching and I needed to go home. But there were still some things that I wanted to resolve, so I went back to Hope Road. A big part of the trauma for Laura has been this thing of not being believed. She was really hurt that you, one of her closest friends, didn't believe her when she identified her attacker. I don't want you to feel terrible. I, 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 you can't help it. I mean, you can. <laughs> that, you know, Laura, I'm sorry. <sighs> Cecily admitted that she dismissed Laura's identification of the suspect as wrong because she knew the boy. What did I know about them? Their mother was um, a woman who she was one of the, the, the mothers who used to kiss her children goodnight still in standard five. When, you know, she used to kiss her boys goodnight. That's, that's, that's how I knew them. He was such a nice boy. Such a nice boy. Nice boys don't do that. After she'd moved to Australia, Laura had very little contact with her son and granddaughters and the attack was a taboo subject that was like a barrier between them. She felt Michael still blamed her. I blamed her, mm. not a chance. No, you did. You said it was her fault for letting him in the house. That's not blaming somebody. That's how it felt to her. No, well, that's not blaming somebody. What do you say to the person? You say, there is a vicious lion. You go into the lion path. You say, those lions are man-eaters. Do not get out of your car. He didn't look like a vicious lion. He looked like a, a handsome, presentable young man. I mean, what does he think these people look like? That they're walking around with a label on their back that says rapist? I mean, does he think that I'm so unintelligent that I would let a person into the house who was dicey? But Michael has always thought this, and, and he still does. Yeah, well, if I'm going to speak to Laura, I will do it in front of her and not in front of this thing. This is bullshit, this. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You keep on pointing your finger at me like I'm the big bad ogre and I'm, I'm, I just uh, 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 am so mean to everybody. Because I don't have this magical way of showing feelings and, and expressing myself and doing the big huggy huggy thing with people. It doesn't work. I know what I feel. Now, sure, that was tough. I don't, I don't think I'd want to go through that. When you say, why did you do that? That's not blame. That is a blame. It's not blame. It's blame. That's a question. It implies a blame. Right, well, then, that's it. No, hang on, that can... No, no. If you're going to harp on something like that, and, and, and you're going to pick it and say, keep on saying that I was blaming Laura, you can forget this right now, because I did not blame anybody. Yeah, I, I never realised that one little statement like that could cause mom to have so, so much trauma. Now, uh, uh, now, do you think I could tie this together? 
Do you think I saw the, the, the connection there? I didn't see it. I know that within my heart I have the right intentions. I would like to help, but I don't know how. I'm, I'm, you, you, you've, you've actually got me into a place where I'm very, very... Oh, I, I just want to put this. I'm sorry and I really hope that this can make it better. That's all I can say. Michael, that's... thank you. I never got to meet Nelson Mandela, but in one of life's strange ironies, my brother Michael did. Mr. Mandela came to his workplace to give his blessing to their racing team heading for Europe. And as I watched him through jealous eyes, I was reminded that life doesn't always work out the way you want it to. The South African police had always been the butt of Michael's jokes, so meeting the head of the Sexual Offences Unit was a bit of a challenge for him. But when he saw the extent and detail of the new investigation, even he had to admit that perhaps things were changing in the new South Africa. We fully investigated and this is the best product that we can give to the prosecutor and hopefully that will be enough to, to get a, a, at least a, a, a um, a court case going. For the first time, Michael glimpsed the possibility of some justice, and he agreed to take over the handling of the case. Okay, good luck with that in the case. Okay. Thanks again, okay. very, very much. It's uh, been a great meeting. Yeah, Andre, travel safe. Super, yeah. Okay, nice meeting you. I'd just like to meet my brother, oh, Michael. Hi, pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet okay. you too. This is Arnold Buenstra. Um, my brother will still be here, he lives uh, here, so if there's anything I'll further... Just, I'll, I'll keep in contact with him. As soon as I hear anything from the DPP, I'll, I'll give him a call. Yeah. All right, well, enjoy it. Thanks for everything, eh? It's a pleasure. Okay, bye. Okay, cheers, bye. Sorry. Oh, come let us Michael did finally tell his daughters the truth about Laura. To our Nana, I learned so much about you over these past few days and weeks. I was deeply hurt by the events that happened to you before you left for Australia, and I'm praying that your wounds will he be healed by the love and efforts of your children and us grandchildren. The last time I, I met you, I was only three. It is so nice to know I do have a grandmother, and the news I, that I heard about you was heartbreaking. I just want to wish you a Merry Christmas and hope that you recover fully from what happened. Well, I will try to write. Love, Mike. <laughs> I know what it is. And she is being very optimistic. <laughs> she can't be. She's joking. She's joking. Do you think I'm going to fit into it? God, what is it, Laura? Of course, it's a bathing costume. She, she remembers me walking around in my bathing costume because it was always so hot. The very fact that they opened the case the very fact that they've investigated him, the fact that he knows he's being investigated, and he knows that I still know and I am still convinced, and he knows now that he has not fooled me, and uh, he has not fooled you, and uh, he's also battling now to, to come to terms as to whether he's going to be able to fool the police. Do you want them to go forward and try and get a, get a court hearing and, and, if necessary, go and testify? I'd love it. I'd love it. I think, I think that, that he should be punished. Uh, it would be absolutely marvellous if legally it could happen. 
Uh, I'm not pinning all my hopes on it. Hello? Michael, it's Laura. Just phoning to say thank you for the Christmas gifts and the messages that you sent. It, it, they, were, they were wonderful. No, oh, it's okay. Michael's apology enabled me to forgive him because although I could understand where he was coming from, uh, I still needed him to apologise for me to fully forgive him. And I have found from experience that uh, forgiveness is a double blessing. It, forgive, it's, it helps the forgiven and the forgiving. And it sets you free. But uh, I'm afraid I can never forgive the attacker. Because if I do that, then I am condoning what he did. And I can never condone what he did. I still get depressed sometimes and angry that my attacker has not yet been brought to justice. But I've come out of my isolation and I'm renewing my faith in human nature. Two exercises, so far. Third one, you're going to come down. Do you think, we, you think I'm going to make it? Huh? Do you think I'll ever get so. there? <laughs> if you keep on doing that, you'll probably take off, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I want to take off. I want to take off the weight. Oh, Two days before Christmas in 1988, my mother was sexually assaulted and savagely beaten in her home in South Africa by a young white teenager. Even though she identified her attacker from a school photograph, 
the boy was never charged and remained free. Twelve years later, my mother had still not recovered from the attack and had withdrawn from the world. Desperate to find something that would help her, I went to South Africa in search of some form of justice. I managed to get the case reopened, but when the investigation bogged down, I took matters into my own hands. So I'm talking to you, is that getting a good picture? Well, as you can see there on the, on, on the screen, you can see the picture. Armed with a hidden camera, I went out to confront the man myself. The woman that you assaulted in Hope Road, Orange Grove in 1988, that was my mother. Sorry?
just saw uh, this film, The Man Who Stole My Mother's Face, at the Tribeca Film Festival here in New York, and I was uh, profoundly moved by it. I think it starts um, in the in a in a terrible event that really changes the landscape of a family, uh, and tells the story not only of that family, the courage of the daughter who um, was determined to help her mother find closure for this tar terrible thing that happened to her, being raped, um, the courage of the mother uh, who in the end comes to life when she realizes that attention is being paid and there's possibility for some sort of justice and in the wider picture of what's happening in this with this issue, this terrible problem in the whole country of South Africa and across the world. So it starts very specifically and tells this really riveting story um, and puts it in a greater context. I think it's, it's a tremendously important movie uh, for anyone who cares about violence against women and uh, anyone who cares about the viability of a family and healing as opposed to um, just hopeless destruction. So I was, I was very taken with it. And I hope everybody will have a chance to look at it and be strengthened by it and inspired by it and healed by it. story about the Australian film which has topped the honours list at a prestigious film festival in New York. The film The Man Who Stole My Mother's Face has been named the best documentary at the Robert De Niro Tribeca Film Festival. Kathy Hankel, good morning, congratulations. Thanks very much. Y you are proud of yourself, I hope. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's a weird concept to, I mean, I was so honoured just to be selected for the, for the Tribeca Film Festival and be invited to New York and you know, taken over there. It was, you know, that was exciting in itself. To win was just beyond really even thinking about. What are you man, going to see? The man who stole my mother's face. We can't wait, actually. We've heard about it. It's a brilliant film, and uh, you're not just a great filmmaker, you're also a courageous daughter and a wonderful sister. What, you know, <laughs> thank you. I really love this film. Incredible film, and I hope all due justice is done at the at the end of this film in other countries. It was a great film. Thank you so much. It's very empowering, and I recommend it to everyone all over the world, especially men. Check it out. I think you did a tremendous job. Great, great film. Um, your objectivity in such a personal matter was fabulous. For myself as a man, seeing the men in the film sort of um, the one uh, South African man talk about. Um, his girlfriend that had been raped um, and sort of how he felt so passionately about it made me feel, um, I guess made me connect a lot more with the issue of rape than I'd ever before been able to, and particularly your brother Michael, um, the brother in the film, made me feel like uh, it was my own issue as well as his. It was awesome. I actually just wanted to say that this is a subject that's very close to my heart because I do work in women's shelters and um, I am an activist in the sense of trying to keep everyone informed and I just wanted to say that this is a subject that is usually dealt in a very sterile and cold manner and I was very impressed and very proud to you know hear you speak and see the film and realize that it can be done and with a touch of humanity to it um, and yeah that's it it was, it was wonderful. Um, thank you so much for making this movie it was extremely emotional very moving and something very personal to me just even having had friends who have been raped and I think as a, an American as someone who is African as well and as a woman I felt like it it really spoke to my heart in so many different levels and I feel like the movie was very healing even for me and I can't wait to tell other people about it and make sure that they see it. and I think just it had a really powerful message and it didn't 
I, it just it was very healing for me, and I'm glad I got to see the movie. So thank you. It was excellent. Just really moved. I think you're amazing. I think the whole movie was amazing, and your mother was just very heartwarming, and, and I really appreciated. It. Can I have a card? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. The film The Man Who Stole My Mother's Face has been named the best documentary at the Robert De Niro Tribeca Film Festival and its director Kathy Henkel says she wanted her film to be uplifting despite its confronting subject, the rape and bashing of her mother. The feeling that you have when you, your name is called as a winner is quite unreal. It's surreal really. Um, I think I, I just went into a kind of state of shock at that moment. Um, but I apparently got quite... Um, happily onto the stage without tripping over and made a fairly good speech and remembered to thank all the right people. So, um, yeah, it was very, a very strange feeling, um, but very wonderful too. Yeah. You are proud of yourself, I hope. I am, I am proud. I'm proud for, you know, lots of reasons, for my mother um, and for all the people who supported the film here in Australia and for the, the fact that a film about sexual assault um, could do so well. Mm. It's such a tough subject. Well, it really brings into focus the whole issue of sexual assault, doesn't it? Yes, that's right. Filmmaker Kathy Henkel, who's just won that award in New York, and you'll be able to see her award-winning documentary on ABC TV later this year. amazing feeling okay I'm here at the Tribeca Film Festival and we just found out that our documentary won the best feature documentary uh, shared prize with a Palestinian film which is a beautiful film so I'm over the moon this is really very strange I'm very excited everybody's really happy our distributors here are really happy this will help the film in Australia it'll help it to reach new audiences in America and all over the world me being in the film is very weird because I'm the director as well and it's very strange. And now doing this interview, here I am on this side of the camera talking about the film, which I hope to put this on the website. So yeah, it is, it's, I much prefer to be on the back end of the camera. But in this story, I had to be in the film because I was the protagonist in the film. So I had to put myself in it. But I'm not going to do it again, believe me. And that's it. Cut. They had to drill holes into my head here and here and they put an enormous um, iron cage in front of me here. I wanted to scream, what have you done to my face? What has happened? I really believed that my face was so disfigured that I looked like a monster. Laura went into psychiatric care for three years and then moved into a small housing commission flat and became a virtual hermit. They called it post-traumatic stress, but for Laura, life was meaningless and she wanted nothing to do with the outside world. And time did not heal. One of the reasons I became a hermit and why I remained a hermit was that when I looked in the mirror, I saw this terrible face looking back at me. And uh, I was quite convinced that everybody else saw it as terrible as I did. And uh, so I didn't want to, I didn't want to inflict it on people. I just felt that uh, people would not like to look at that. Um, but since the making of this film, uh, I have got such a different kind of feedback from people that they seem to see almost, uh, they almost see, see a beauty or uh, they see courage, they see, they see some things in me that I don't see when I look at the mirror. Uh, I do get out quite a lot more. I get out quite a bit. I go to U3A about two, three, three, four times a week. Uh, we have classes on uh, philosophy, history, uh, Shakespeare, great painters. Uh, we have a discussion, debating group, and I uh, belong to a 
a creative writers group. The most common argument against space exploration is that all that money would be better spent on helping the poor. Then there's the exercise groups. <laughs> we go to the heated pool, and uh, we just I'm just starting up yoga. <laughs> and I oh, and I've been playing life ball, which is a <laughs> say it's 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 really a walking basketball, <laughs> and but it's great fun, and it uh, it's surprisingly tiring. <laughs> Uh, shoot. All right. Yeah. I've just got a, an email here, which is uh, which is about the poem that I submitted to this um, poetry competition, and they're telling me here that uh, I'm a semi-finalist, and that uh, I have an excellent chance. I'm reading. I'm quoting. I have an excellent chance of winning one of the prizes, including the first prize. And then uh, also they're saying that they're going to um, put out a publication and they're going to publish my poem. The Women's Health Centre invited me to uh, lead a march to uh, reclaim the night. And uh, we, we marched around to Lismore. And then afterwards we went to the Star Court and there was a um, showing of the film. <laughs> My greatest achievement has been that I have learnt to trust people again. And I am learning and still learning to like, even love, humanity, society, life itself. I had two children, Michael, boisterous and headstrong, and Kathy, who was painfully shy as a child. And I made the decision to devote myself entirely to the task of being as good a mother as I possibly could be. In Laura's case, um, a certain amount of it was brought upon by herself. The fact that to invite a person into your house after midnight to come in and have a cup of tea or something like that in the current situation is not done. I blamed her, not a chance. We did. You said it was her fault for letting him in the house. That's not blaming somebody. That's how it felt to her. No, well, that's not blaming somebody. Well, if I'm going to speak to Laura, I will do it in front of her and not in front of this thing. This is bullshit, this. I, I'm... I'm you, you, you've, you've actually got me into a place where I'm very, very... Oh, I, I don't want to put this. I'm sorry, and I really hope that this can make it better. That's all I can say. Michael. Thank you. <laughs> Are you still cross with me for having put you through that ordeal? Oh, there were times when I was cross. But obviously now that one sees what, what the effect is of, of it all, then it's, it, it, at one point it seemed to me, what is it all about? It didn't seem to have the, any purpose. It, it was um, some crazed mission my sister's on. But now that it's all done and the, 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 the final product uh, has come out, the film is there, the, the, the reaction from my mother, and to see the turnaround from that, uh, that absolutely depressed person sitting there, uh, it's heartbreaking to see that. To see someone in our smiling, socializing with people, Getting out, doing things, that is definitely, it is, it's made this all so worthwhile. So now, what one can learn from this is to have the, the, the necessary compassion and understanding that 
when something like this happens, it's not that person's fault. And, and to not try and apportion in any way hidden or, un, uh, in my case, implied or perceived to be implied um, accusation, then you've learned something and then you, you, you can treat that person in a way that they don't feel that they did something wrong. And then, of course, the healing process goes a lot quicker. It could have been done without form. It, 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 it needed a mediator, somebody like yourself, who uh, is, is able to be compassionate to both sides and understand both sides of the story, and then it, it could have happened as well. Uh, the fact that it's been done through film is, uh, to me, it's just another way of doing things. But the film now, because it's hard documented um, material, can now be taken to other families and internationally and shown so it's not just our family that's healed now it can now work for other people look what we did and if we uh, as a bunch of clowns can do this then anyone can do it Under the new South African government, a unit had been established in Johannesburg to deal specifically with sexual assault and child rape cases. The head of the unit was Superintendent Andre Neertling, and he had some good news for me. We are the investigative authority. We are not the prosecuting authority. But what we can do from our side is to reopen the case and look at those questions that you had, because if a case was withdrawn, it can be reopened at any time. Andre assigned the case to Captain Arnold Buenstra and gave me permission to follow the investigation and to film it. Police work in Johannesburg is dangerous, and hundreds of police officers are killed each year in the line of duty. Arnold and his buddy Ferdy always work together and their main focus was the investigation of serial rapists and child rape. All cases of rape that was investigated. He had over 80 cases that he was currently investigating, including many of child and baby rape, and understandably these had to take precedence over my mother's case. We've got 1,800 cases that we investigate at the moment, which is all we cannot distinguish between our cases. Um, these are all, it's not property crime, these are all assault on people. We fully investigated and this is the best product that we can give to the prosecutor and hopefully that will be enough to, to get a, a, at least a, 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 um, a court case going. Arnold and Ferdi that you met uh, during making this film haven't slept for three days now. I actually had to force them to go home last night and get some sleep and, and, and but they were start, they started at five o'clock this morning again. And they look a bit haggard at this stage. <laughs> so I'm not gonna be able to see them. Um, I doubt it. I don't think they wanna be seen like the way they're looking at them the moment. They they are visibly very tired, red eyes and whatever. Have you got any more resources than you had a year ago? Yes. Um, Can you say that? We had an a specific in Gauteng. Uh, the, 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 I, I believe there's an absolute urgency around crimes committed against women and children and our units specifically. Uh, the units were resourced to capacity by the just after, uh, soon after you left and all the units were resourced in terms of vehicles and, and, and logistical resources to capacity. Uh, sec uh, sexual abuse, uh, rape, uh, sexual assault, those kind of things happen. In, in, in privacy. It's not like an armed robbery where people burst into a bank and you've got 20, 30 eyewitnesses and whatever. This happens usually, these people are alone in a room, it happens in seclusion. So you sit with the, the situation of a single witness. And that's why it's so prominent for me that we were able to have 24 life sentences issued. Uh, uh, considering how difficult it often is to deal with these cases. Uh, the, uh, be, besides the um, of 24 life sentences issued, um, 44 uh, uh, sexual predators received uh, um, 
uh, uh, jail sentences which ranged bef between 10 and 25 years another 44 on top of that so um, I think that that's just proof in terms of that that it, uh, uh, we can't, can't sit down and be say we can't prove these cases let's stop working on it or, or, or let's just take it as it comes or whatever you've got to work hard on it and, and you, can, you, you can get justice at the end of the day so I haven't been following your mom's case as close but uh, the last that I dealt with it it was presented to the director of public prosecutions for decision and subsequently I believe Arnold Boonstra, the investigating officer, is still investigating the matter. What can you tell me about the status of the investigation of my mother's case? Well, the, the case is, we have, we have the docket, and we've looked through it. We have discovered that there are a number of gaps that exist in the investigation that need to be done. Um, and we are taking it very seriously. We are putting, um, you know, some steps into having it further investigated to see if at the end of the day we can proceed with the case or not. But we are also considering whether we shouldn't have a separate and national team because of what we are finding in terms of how the investigations continued. Uh, we need to look at whether we shouldn't have a different team investigating, um, you know, this, ca this case further so that that team can identify other issues that we need to be looking at in terms of whether it's disciplinary action that we can take against people who have not done their job well. Or I, I, I would like seriously to say I'm really sorry about the experience. Um, it's not something you wish on your worst enemy. Um, and certainly we are trying to do our best, you know, to, to, you know, to settle the matter. Uh, one way or the other. We will give a feedback of what has transpired and of our decision whether or not it is to prosecute. I think she was talented. I was very fond of her. She used to, she used to get on my nerves often, but um, I loved her. Laura showed me a picture from the Highlands Boys High School magazine that the police, that somebody had given her. And she, they, she was asked to identify, and she identified what looked like one young man, and of course it's somebody that I happen to know. He was such a nice boy. Such a nice boy. Nice boys don't do that. Under the circumstances, it's her story um, and that is her story and that's the way the story went and I accept it fully. And my not believing her must have robbed her of self-belief and um, just added to her, her, her lack of faith in people. And it must have been a terrible thing for her. I think that the film was really inspiring. You know, I don't know if you noticed when when, I, when we first started the film, I was sitting crocheting, and that that blanket that I was crocheting went down on the floor, and I sat watching it. It's first of all, you, t the film made something that was so ugly into something beautiful. I was reminded when I saw the film that I spoke about Laura's soul and her, and her face. I, I connected the two at the beginning of the film. And at the end of the film, when I saw Laura having her rant, and I saw the life and the animation in her face, I saw that soul come to life again. It didn't matter about her face. And, and, and so um, I think that the film not only artistically has merit, but I think that the, f the film has done something more than just an art form. I think it's brought a woman back to life. And I once told you that I hope that my daughter one day can do for me what you've done as a daughter for Laura. And I'll say it again now, that you have been a wonderful, wonderful daughter to your mother.
I hope I've played a better part in her life than I did in her film. <laughs> For sure. Hi, Kathy. How are you? It's nice to see you again. Glory had been to a court hearing the previous day in relation to the rape of her twin daughters and was furious at the outcome. The perpetrator, who lived four doors down the street from her, had been released on bail. I was so depressed I couldn't even have dinner. I had this terrible headache and I think maybe it must have been nerves or what because I couldn't just believe that um, they are uh, reminding it to next year, February. It's four months. It's too much. And this guy's still walking around free. He was in a new suit, new shoes, new shirt, and he was so boastful and like, I don't know. He's still around, I saw him yesterday. This is dangerous, you know, it's like a virus. It's like something, we should stop this now. I can see a light, there is a light there at the end of the tunnel. It's shining brightly. I want to help women and children because I think there's a big gap there. People are there struggling and I realize that people, you know, get tired when they're busy with their cases and something goes wrong. They just say, ah, I'm just going to leave it at that because, you know, it's so tiring. We both have experienced this thing. You know, you, you can't just go on without any light. So people uh, give up most of the time. So I want to encourage people not to give up. It's almost two years now that this guy raped and sodomized my kids and justice, Nanda, nothing at all. I've been everywhere, all these de departments and they're not helping. They do promise. They promise me that they'll do something about it. They uh, also come here, interview me, but afterwards I think uh, when they just turn their backs, they take the papers and throw them into the bins. Nothing is happening. So now luckily some time ago I was so depressed after this senior prosecutor told me that my case will never go to court this um, yeah, because my kids don't want to get used to a stranger thing, you know. I told her that there is no way my kids are going to be questioned by a stranger who will just uh, immediately get into the whole questioning thing and ask them who raped them and uh, uh, things like that. So I went back to the Department of Safety and Security and they referred me to the National Director of persecutions and there this one lady promised me an advocate promised me I can't say promised again this one I promise you I, I, I don't know I've got that hope I think she's gonna do something I won't I won't give up I promise you I won't give up not for my kids Remember, I'm the only one. I'm like a mother and father to them. Mother, father, sister, everything to them. I don't have parents who can support me. I don't have a husband who can support me. Um, my sisters also have their problems. So I've got, to, I've got to be strong for them. My kids can't go to school. They're still here at home. We're still frustrated. They're still frustrated. They're asking me every day when they're going to school. I can't take them because I'm too scared of this guy. Flower, look at that. They're in jail, yeah. We're all in jail. We can't go anywhere. Uh, uh, the woman, the nanny who looks after them, can't go anywhere with them. I'm the only one who's allowed to go with them anywhere because I'm scared of this guy. He can see us coming and going. Do you still feel that he's a threat to you? He is very much so. He still is because of his uh, status. You know, he's a drug lord, he's a high king. He has killed many people. Has he made any attempts on your life? He did. About, I think now, it's about two months ago, I was from town. Um, I had my uh, groceries, two plastic, big plastic of uh, uh, vegetables and groceries, and he tried to run me over with this car. I just had this car coming, speeding, and I jumped, you know. 
Next to me, I jumped, and when I looked back, it was him. My case is not a case in isolation. Uh, many cases are like that. That is why the conviction rate is uh, less than 4% on all these cases. And that is why the rapes are still going on, and they are not going to stop until the government does something. They should stop promising people and they should stop going on shouting that they'll do something because they want our votes. They shouldn't do that to us. I'm keeping on and I've got this hope that there is no way my case will just end no way. There is no way I'm gonna fight till the end. My children are very different, and I was surprised that it was Kathy who followed in her father's footsteps and became a filmmaker. She moved to Australia, and Michael stayed, married, and took up motor car racing. Seeing my mother shut herself away for all those years, I felt as if I'd lost her, and nothing I could do would bring her back. Finally, in desperation, I proposed going back to Johannesburg to try and get the case reopened. Laura was dubious at first, but she agreed. It was becoming clear that without some form of justice, she would never get over it. One of the main reasons why I made the film was the frustration and distress that I felt from seeing my mother uh, locked away from the world and unable to heal and unable to recover and knowing that without some kind of resolution, acknowledgement and perhaps some form of justice that she would never just get over it. So the film was, in, was motivated by that frustration. Now that the film has helped my mother so much and she is um, able to trust people again and to feel that she can go out and show her face to the world and take part in activities and you know be part of society again that frustration is gone I mean that's a, a really fantastic outcome and it's actually beyond what I ever imagined it to me it's a bit of a miracle the impact that it's had on her um, I still have frustrations in some of the other stories um, that I encountered, Glory's story is still not resolved and I feel very angry and frustrated about that. I do feel frustration that the case is still not resolved. My mother's case is still being investigated now, two years since I left there, and that feels um, ludicrous and drives me nuts. I would like to see the justice system be able to respond better to um, people's trauma and be able to you know, get justice in more cases than it does. I think the most beautiful surprise for me has been my brother. I feel he has moved through something really huge in the making of this film. And he said to me the other day when I spoke to him on the phone that he has really learnt empathy. And I think that's very inspiring for people to know that, that people can learn that. And that he has shifted from feeling angry and feeling in denial about it and not wanting to deal with it to feeling enormous empathy and, and understanding what happened to my mother and being able to apologise and forgive. It's been a really big experience for my brother and I'm really proud of him in what he's done. And our relationship is better than it's ever been and I think that's been the best surprise. I think the film is having an interesting response with male audiences, um, partly because of my brother's story and that men feel that there's a, there's a place for them in a story about sexual assault and his journey through denial and blocking it and you know the implications of blame are very common and a lot of men respond to that and the fact that he was able to see through that and talk about his feelings is very it's very good that men are able to connect with that and the police story as well so I think the film is reaching male audiences and I'm hoping that it will reach a very wide audience around the world and get discussion about sexual assault out in the open, widely discussed in the media, and at least bring the issue out from under the table so that then methods of dealing with 
this crisis can be brought forward when people know just how prevalent it is and the implications that, and the effect that it has on women and families and men and people who, who, who are affected by sexual assault. In Australia, the best statistics we've got on incidents and prevalence for sexual violence is a survey that was done in 1996. Mm. And through that survey, um, within the previous 12 months of that survey, there was over 100,000 women that said they'd been sexually assaulted. And when they asked women to reflect on their lives since the age of 15, there were over a million women who could identify um, experiences of sexual violence at some stage. In Australia, the figures on reporting have remained fairly static, so um, some would suggest that it's as, as few as, as one in ten that literally report a sexual assault to the police. Um, so that's nine out of ten women who do not disclose or report to police. Um, they, there were some that would also suggest, and certainly research would support, that women won't even tell a service um, in any great numbers. Um, so there might only be four out of ten women who would literally uh, call a service or even anonymously um, disclose that they've been sexually assaulted. They take place in the home. I mean absolutely predominantly in the home, whether that's her home, his home or a home, private home, it is almost um, overwhelmingly in a private residence or in a private place. There certainly are um, assaults that occur in other contexts, so there, there are a small proportion of rapes that occur um, where, there's, where strangers are the perpetrator. Um, again, they often occur in a private home, potentially in her, in her home, the victim survivor's home, more than any other home. Um, public places are, are much less likely to be a venue or a location for a rape or a sexual assault. The long-term health effects for sexual assault and physical violence um, are extraordinary. We have really powerful evidence bases for that and we certainly have for many, many years known that the impact of sexual assault or rape has really long-term and quite damaging effects on women's mental health, on their capacity to uh, re-engage with the social world in which they live. They sometimes become agoraphobic. They develop what's called post-traumatic stress disorder. That might mean that they have nightmares, um, that they have flashbacks, that they dissociate from certain contexts. We also know um, more recently perhaps that the longer term health effects literally on their physical health can be uh, incredibly damaging. Women do face um, incredible levels of disbelief still. Um, not just in any kind of public context like a court context, but they also face it from family members and friends. They're questioned about you know, why they let him in or why they uh, went with him somewhere, why they were drinking with him, um, how they couldn't have known it was going to turn into you know, a rape situation. What we do know is there are a minuscule number of false allegations, a minuscule number of charges that are laid against women for making false allegations. Um, but there is absolutely the assumption that most women who report this crime um, or who report this assault are making it up. Um, the fear of, of being blamed for the assault is overwhelming, I think, for women and often keeps them silent for years, if not decades. Um, I think they also face a number of um, barriers or disincentives to thinking about going through a process where they'll have to talk about the intimate detail of the assault. So if they contemplate reporting to police, I think women get that they're going to have to tell a complete stranger exactly what happened. Um, I think they fear that if they do go ahead with reporting and they do go through a court process, uh, that it'll result in an acquittal or he'll get off. And that will mean a jury doesn't believe them. It will mean that the courts um, have exposed them to what's often a gruelling process of cross-examination. Um, they often, I think, I think, feel completely kind of stripped bare in that context and often talk about secondary victimisation in those contexts or uh, feeling that it wasn't worth it.